every detective's nightmare, instinct and circumstantial evidence both point to murder. But there's no body. While we felt that something had happened in the farm, our efforts directed at obtaining forensic evidence ultimately proved completely fruitless. Every family's greatest horror, no word from a loved one, increasingly chilling silence, but never the final confirmation. Although we can close that chapter, we can't close the book. We need to know what's happened, but we don't know whether we ever will. How do you catch a killer and put them behind bars when you have motive and a history of violence, but the killer is clever? The investigation was potentially the most difficult in my career. This is what happens when a victim disappears without trace because their attacker decides they're going to get away with murder. One of the gentlest, most tranquil landscapes in Britain, Gloucestershire and the Cotswolds, flowers, century-old houses, soft yellow stone. It's a small community and a, a very pleasant English village. Not the sort of place that you'd expect any drama or anything untoward to be happening. A perfect setting for Kate Wakefield's dream come true, finding love in her 50s. I thought, well, that's nice that she's actually found somebody who cares for her. Kate, born into a farming family in 1952, had three brothers and two sisters. She went to the local village primary school, then in her teens moved with her family to Fennell's Farm in the village of Lippiot. She studied for her A-levels, then took teacher training qualifications. Her brothers, Ted and Richard, took up farming. Across the field there, I don't know if you can see amongst the trees, there's a lovely old Cotswold house, Cotswold Stone House where my parents lived, and that's where we all lived. And in 1992, my brother Edward built this house here. And this is the main farmhouse now. When her parents died, Kate and her sister inherited the original farmhouse. Eventually, they sold it, and Kate moved in with her brother Ted. Soon afterwards, someone else moved on to Ted's farm. Adrian Prout, a neighbour who had been going through a turbulent patch. Adrian moved on to Ted's farm in about 1999. On this piece of ground here, which you can see has been cleared, and Adrian kept a caravan on here and lived on here for a while. After a relationship had broken up, and whilst he was here, he helped Ted do jobs on the farm, and he was very... Um, well, he's, he was very helpful at that time. Adrian had also just broken up from a pipe-laying business partnership. He brought the heavy machinery with him and worked on the farm as he contemplated setting up on his own. He was just an ordinary chap trying to get on, really. He worked hard, and he was very good at making money. And I became friends with him. It wasn't long before he met Kate, who was sharing the house with her brother, Ted. I think Adrian was a, a very hard-working individual, very down-to-earth, a very quiet man, and from farming stock. Kate, although from, from farming stock, was, was quite different, I think, in her outlook and, and the things that she chose as her pursuits to Adrian. So in very many ways, they were, they were somewhat opposite. A relationship quickly blossomed the family hoped this was a case of opposites attract. Kate could be awkward, but she could be loving as well. Sincere, it would be a good word. You know, once they got together, that was it with Kate. I thought, oh, yes, you know, they went well together. I think Kate liked somebody that could take control and she didn't have to do and make all the decisions. At the same time, Kate was never going to be a pushover. I did warn Adrian about Kate. She could be um, volatile at times. 
Kate was a kind, caring person, but she did have a temper. You know, she'd stick out for what she felt was right. In September 2000, Kate took £147,000 she'd inherited through the sale of her father's house and invested it in a beautiful new home she and Adrian bought for £210,000 in Frampton-on-Severn, famed for its picture-postcard village life and what's reputed to be the longest village green in England. They held a wedding in St Mary's Church. Kate seemed very happy. We had a lovely evening. They had someone playing the violin and um, it was a good time. Everything seemed perfect. It was impossible for the family to imagine that the seeds were already sown for tragedy. Kate and Adrian Prout, recently wedded in Gloucestershire, were about to move to the next stage of their dream. In 2004, they sold the house in which Kate had invested her inheritance at a good profit and together bought Redhill Farm at Red Marley for £820,000. Adrian always wanted a farm. Farming's in his blood. And when this farm came along, it was a golden opportunity to go and buy it. From Adrian Prout's point of view, I think that the, the move to Redhill Farm finally fulfilled a lifetime dream. He'd always wanted to own his own farm, and he'd finally got what he wanted. Kate loved the countryside, walks and dogs. So, you know, it was idyllic for them, really. Adrian had resumed his pipe-playing business and was making good money, but it wasn't long before the first signs of tension emerged. Things weren't going as well as they could have been, but like all marriages, you have your ups and downs and you have to work at it. Adrian had a daughter, Laura, from a previous relationship. She moved in with the couple at Redhill Farm. Suddenly, there was a shift in the relationship between Adrian and Kate. It's difficult both sides, you know, it must have been difficult for Laura accepting somebody else. And it was difficult for Kate, she'd never had children, although she'd been a teacher. No, I was predicted to be. Kate but did okay. try and help her a lot, but obviously Kate did come between Laura and her dad. Kate kept a record of her life with Adrian. In 2006, she wrote of friction in the household. One of the things that became important to us later on during the course of our investigation was that Kate kept a diary, or I should say diaries, and very many of the events, and particularly the events that took place during the course of the marriage and the events that took place between them, she recorded in her diary. Her diary made plain another growing source of tension. Adrian had a newly developed passion, stemming from the time he'd lived on Ted Wakefield's farm. When I first met Adrian, I was quite keen on shooting then, game shooting, and he couldn't see the fascination of it at all. And it turned totally around in the end. He became obsessed with it. When they bought Red Hill Farm, there was already a shoot on the farm. And so Adrian decided to carry on with the shoot. But Kate, Kate was never that keen on it, really. But charging people for a day's shoot was good business, and Kate agreed to prepare the food. Kate was very good at cooking and organising things. I think they got the beds locally from Ledbury, but she'd make all the soups and everything. And one time she couldn't do it, and somebody else brought some stuff in, and nobody said, you know, oh, it's not as good as Kate's. When you could definitely tell the homemade was a lot better, and she got a bit cheesed off with it because she put a lot of effort into it. Adrian, would you like anything else to eat? No, thanks. Increasingly, cracks in the relationship became apparent. Kate told me, actually. She said Adrian lacks social skills. I mean, he didn't really like going out, you know. Kate liked art, things like that. She'd like to go to the theatre. It wasn't Adrian's cup of tea, really. He'd rather just stay home. But at Christmas 2006, 
there was new stress. When Laura invited her boyfriend over, tensions mounted between Adrian and Kate. It was his own daughter, and Adrian would usually side with Laura. At lunchtime on Boxing Day, things came to a head. Kate was in the final stages of preparing a meal for the four of them. She was in no mood to discover she'd been wasting her time. Minutes before the meal was ready, Laura and her boyfriend dropped what to Kate came as a shock. Here we go. Go? Yes. Where? They decided to change the plans at the last minute. They didn't stay for lunch, and that was the cause of the disagreement that day. You sat and watched me prepare all this. And that was a disagreement of such proportion that Laura left the farm that day. And in fact, that was the last day she ever resided with or lived with Kate and Adrian. She never came back after that. Back in the kitchen, months of tension erupted into violence. You and her, that's the matter with me. Every time, Kate! Adrian, I'm talking to you! The argument spilled from the kitchen into the yard. Oh, Adrian hurled her against the car so hard it dented the metal. Kate's diary entry, recording the events of that day, was brief. All hell broke loose at home. Had words with the little madam, got sloshed, argued, and he said it's all over and wants us to divorce. She suddenly turned up at our house, and it turns out there'd been a bit of a problem Boxing Day. They'd had another row. Adrian had pushed her against the car quite forcibly. So she felt she wanted to come get away from the house. She did go back, and she did tell Adrian it was nice to have lunch with what she called a proper family. Five weeks later, in February 2007, violence erupted again. We had a call. She said, something terrible's happened. Is it OK for me to stay? And I said, yes. She said, it's awful. Adrian's been arrested. Um, I've had a drink. So I said, we'll come and get you. Stay where you are. We'll come and get you. She was terribly upset. And she then went to explain what exactly had happened. She'd made allegations that after a bout of plate throwing between the both of them, she'd been dragged outside by Adrian and held over a swimming pool, an empty swimming pool. She had a high polo neck sweater thing on, and he had her around the neck, almost strangling her. She honestly thought that he was going to throw her in it, and she said, I feared for my life. She honestly thought that he was going to throw her in there. From a police point of view, neither Kate nor Adrian Prout were known to us prior to the 1st of February, 2007. The culmination was that uh, Adrian was arrested on that occasion, but unfortunately, because of the circumstances surrounding the incident and the lack of any corroboration, no further action was taken about Adrian and he wasn't prosecuted or charged with any offences. Kate went to stay with her brother Richard and sister-in-law Linda. In one of her diaries, she recorded the following. The evening he threatened me and I reported him to the police. He was arrested, but no charges he was brought. Arrested, There's no marks but no on charges me. brought. So There's no marks on me. So, insufficient evidence. Officially separated now. Has very frightened to return. He went mad. I really thought that my end had come. As Kate reflected on what had gone wrong, Linda and Richard learned of another source of tension in her marriage, money. Adrian could earn a lot of money, and we didn't realise till Kate came to stay with us that he never actually gave her any money. Any furniture she bought, she bought from her pension money, school pension money, and we were quite shocked at that, really, that she didn't have any money. At first, Kate didn't tell Adrian she'd gone to stay with her brother and his wife. Richard and I said, you know, you really ought to tell Adrian where you are. 
She didn't want him to know to begin with because she was still frightened to think that he'd done that to her. Adrian questioned me a day after, or two days afterwards, if I knew where Kate was. And I had to tell him a lie. But he knew she was there anyway because she had phoned him that day. Adrian was never the same with me after that. He didn't like it because I'd taken Kate in that night. I said to Adrian I didn't want to fall out with him. He said the damage is done already. Kate began taking practical steps towards possible divorce. When Kate was with us, she was in touch with solicitors about divorce proceedings with Adrian because Kate was determined to get what she thought was hers and Adrian didn't want to sell the farm. But Adrian persuaded Kate in the end to drop the proceedings. A month after moving in with Linda and Richard, Kate received a call from Adrian, an offer of reconciliation. She said to me, he wants to meet up and have a chat. So I said, that's fine, just be careful. So they met at the local pub and later that night she rang me and she said, I won't be coming home tonight. And then the next day she rang and she said, could I come back? They'd had a nice evening in the pub. He seemed all concerned and, you know, lovey-dovey. Went back home, had a nice evening as man and wife. But the next day she said he was as cold as ice. But nevertheless, she decided she would stay on the farm with Adrian. I wasn't comfortable about Kate going back. I would have preferred Kate to stay with us. She said she wanted to look after her own interests down at Red Marley. She wanted to be down there to see what was going on, she said. And she was determined to go back. The next few months were tough. March 18th, I woke with Adrian. Nice time. Then, he told me that he wanted to divorce. You have to accept it, Kate. As he had no real feelings for me anymore. March 20th. When we came here, life was looking so good. So much to develop on the farm and in the house. It was so peaceful and a beautiful feeling. My heart was full of hope and excitement. And now, this tragic sense of loss and waste. April 6th. Adrian slept with me made love. Why, oh why, is he giving me these mixed messages? Summer brought flare-ups, brief love, and increasingly stressful conversations about a financial settlement for divorce. Then in September 2007, Kate inadvertently did something which cranked tensions to breaking point. Despite incidents of violence and a temporary separation, Kate and Adrian Prout were still together and Kate hoped their problems could be resolved. But as summer 2007 ended and Adrian was supposed to be going away to work in Yorkshire, she did something she would soon regret. Kate planned to go on holiday with her half-sister to Salisbury and engaged a house sitter to come and look after the farm, to look after things while he was at work walk the dogs, water the plants, and this sort of thing. Adrian and the house sitter got on well, and soon she was doing more than her regular duties. September 30th. A told me that he and the house sitter did some clay pigeon shooting in the week. Never has time to do anything with me. But still hopeful of reconciliation, Kate booked a holiday in Italy for herself and Adrian. October 4th, Adrian announced did not want to go to Italy. Wish I had not booked. October 7th, the house sitter came to lunch. Adrian and she went shooting whilst I cooked it. Tried to be understanding, 
But why should this woman be involved in recreational activities with my husband while I'm cooking for them? Kate took her sister-in-law Linda to Italy instead, on Adrian's suggestion. Once again, the house sitter was booked. I didn't know whether Adrian was having an affair or not, really. Kate was pretty convinced that something was going on. I did feel sorry for her because she strongly believed in her wedding vows. Although we got on well, they should have been together. He was supposed to be on that holiday, not me. The house sitter herself always denied an affair. She said Adrian tried to woo her, but she was in a relationship and didn't respond to his attentions. On Kate's return on October the 19th, Linda and Richard drove her home from the airport, but Adrian was not there to meet her. He was having lunch with the house sitter and his daughter. Soon, the house sitter was ringing Linda and Richard. We had a call to say she'd had Kate on the phone, you know, accusing her of having an affair with Adrian. Kate, I think you need to realise that you're making an absolute fool of yourself. And then we had Kate on the phone in the state. Obviously, she'd been very upset. We felt she had to apologise, which she did do. And in the end, Kate calmed down and she did actually ring to apologise. the issue of Adrian's feelings towards the house sitter was far from resolved. October 20th. Said he couldn't wait to get rid of me, out of his life. Said the house sitter was nice. Hesitated when I asked if he fancied her, say no more. Told me I was overweight, almost fat, that I was old now and unattractive. A week later, the first shoot of the season, Kate provided the food. She'd been drinking consistently during that day to the point where she was becoming quite verbally aggressive. She already suspected her of having an affair with Adrian and she challenged her about that to the embarrassment of quite a number of people that were there. I didn't ask you to look after him, but well, not the way you have been. After the shoot, everyone went to the Rose and Crown pub near the farm. Kate continued drinking. Kate wasn't a drinker, but she did take to drink sometimes when she was very upset. And she consumed a fair drop of alcohol that day. Her behaviour, if anything, worsened to the extent that she was very offensive to Adrian, to Adrian's daughter, Laura, and to Laura's boyfriend and ultimately slapped Adrian in the face. Most of the guests at that point left in embarrassment and she went and spent the evening with a near neighbor. So that would have added to the, the stress and pressure that, that Adrian was being put under by Kate. The following week, Kate spoke to her accountant about the divorce settlement. She'd previously demanded 600,000 pounds in recognition of the inheritance money she'd put towards buying the farm. Her accountant now advised her that with increased land values, she should insist on £800,000. On November the 4th, she broke the news to Adrian. That would probably mean that he would have to sell the farm in order to meet that demand, whereas the £600,000 figure was one that he could have met without losing the farm. He didn't want to sell the farm. That was his life and, life and joy and pride, that farm. and he just didn't want to sell that farm. That meant everything to him. Kate's demand, or the increased demand, was very definitely going to threaten his ability to hang on to, to the dream that he so much cared about, the farm. The next day, Monday, November the 5th, there was another blow for Adrian. He visited his bank and learned that Kate had withdrawn 15,000 pounds to cover legal costs for the divorce money he needed for the farm. There was a bill that needed to be paid in the very near future for some blueberries that had been bought to be planted at the farm. And the fact that Kate had removed that sum of money from that bank account made this extremely difficult for Adrian to satisfy. Now, whilst he may have suspected that this figure had been withdrawn prior to that, on that Monday morning, 
when he went to the bank and made a balance inquiry, he had that confirmed for definite that that sum had in fact been taken. Kate, by contrast, now taking control of her life, seemed that day to those around her to be in good spirits. Monday the 5th of November, she rang, we had a chat, a bit of a laugh and a joke, so everything seemed okay. She went to shop at a country produce store and rang her bank to confirm they had details of the inheritance she'd invested in the farm. Thank you. Bye. But then, nothing. I said to Richard, have you heard from Kate? And he said, no. I said, there's something wrong. We had contact with Kate practically every day. The days of that week passed, and there was no news from either Kate or Adrian. On the Friday, David, a friend of Kate's, visited the farm. There was no one at the farm. Adrian's car had gone. Kate's car was still there. He went in the house because it wasn't locked. Hello? But he said it, he looked around the house and it all looked prim and proper and, and no one was there. Everything seemed fine. So he said he'd still tried to ring them on the mobiles, no reply. Still, there was no clue if either or both of them were missing. The next day, David got through to Adrian. He said he hadn't seen Kate since the Monday. David said, well, haven't you um, informed the police? He said, no. David said, don't you think you ought to inform the police? And he said, I suppose I ought to. David rang me back immediately afterwards and he told me what happened. And so I rang Adrian immediately and I said the same thing to him. I said, why haven't you phoned the police? Well, he said, I will then. The initial response was the response that would be received by any missing persons report. So a uniformed officer was dispatched to uh, Red Hill Farm. David and Richard also headed immediately for the farm. The police officer was already there. It was quite a bright morning, but it wasn't that cold. But I felt really cold that day. I just had an eerie feeling when I went down there. I don't know what it was. And the police officer said to us he didn't think Adrian's emotions and that were right either. The officer in question soon became aware that this was potentially something a little bit more sinister and something more than a straightforward missing persons inquiry. There were a number of reasons for suspecting Adrian Prout. Firstly, Adrian had waited five days to report Kate missing. The account that he gave was that he'd last seen Kate at lunchtime on Monday the 5th of November 2007, and yet he didn't report this until Saturday the 10th of November. That in itself is highly unusual. The other interesting feature of the report made by Adrian was that possibly the only reason he'd chosen to report it even five days later was that he'd been persuaded or cajoled into doing so by a friend of Kate's and Kate's brother, Richard Wakefield. The car was there, a handbag, credit cards, keys, phone, the lot, which is completely out of character for Kate. Kate kept herself together well. She always looked nice if she was going out, and she would not go anywhere without her makeup. So there was obviously something drastically wrong. To all intents and purposes, she had vanished with nothing more than the clothes she stood up in. There was further unease over the divorce battle for money tied up in the farm, with Kate's newly increased demand for £800,000. I knew there was trouble with that farm, with this settlement, and Kate was going to stand out for what was hers. And I knew Kate wouldn't just walk away and leave all that money there either. Next day, Adrian was taken to a police station in Gloucester for questioning. Tell me the circumstances that led up to Kate going missing. Adrian's demeanour and reaction was somewhat unusual in that he, he didn't seem in the, in the slightest bit concerned about where she may be or that any harm may have come to her. What have you done between Monday and yesterday to try and find her? Nothing. Why would 
no. Well, I assume that that's what she wanted. And no one has rang me. Like, if her friend or Richard had known that she was with me, they'd have rang me and said, where is she? And I haven't heard anything, so I thought, she must be all right. Adrian really had no, no credible explanation for what had happened to Kate. He didn't seem concerned about what had happened to Kate. He claimed that on the, uh, the last day that he saw her, um, they disagreed over a meal and had a minor disagreement, but nothing more than that. And the entire situation and his explanation just really did not stack up. I just thought, oh, she's gone off and on a wobbler and I think deep down Richard and I knew that we wouldn't be seeing Kate again. You know, we just wanted to know what had happened to her. It was very hard and very traumatic. Sorry, I'm getting upset. There were some highly unusual features about the whole situation. And these were such that um, on the 14th, the following Wednesday, the 14th of November, it was decided that um, this was possibly far more serious than was initially thought. And I was appointed as a senior investigating officer to look at what initially was a missing persons inquiry, but later turned into something much more serious. There are a number of possibilities, really. One could simply be that Kate had wandered off and was somewhere on the land, maybe, having collapsed or injured herself wanting to be found but, but not being able to return herself to the farm. The second possibility was that she'd gone off deliberately and didn't want to be found. The other possibilities were far more sinister, that a crime had occurred, she'd been abducted or, or in fact murdered. One of the largest search operations conducted in Gloucestershire was launched, involving 60 officers and taking over five weeks to complete. This man was tasked with finding forensic evidence. This is the boundary of Red Hill Farm in Red Marley, which was the scene of the disappearance of Kate Prout and the subsequent search for her over quite a long period of time. To my right here, you can see the scale of the farm area which was being searched. The farm is over 250 acres, and this is about a fifth of the arable side of the farm. It also consisted of at least half of that acreage as woodland. So if you can imagine the difficulty we had in searching this area, um, officers originally went in searching with the parameters to look for any area where a body could have been deposited, either on surface or subsurface. During this search, they indicated in excess of 100 areas where this could be. So you can imagine the length and the breadth of searching we had to do. And eventually, um, we ruled all those areas out and she was not found in any of them. A detailed search of the house, too, turned up nothing. We did enlist the assistance of specialist search dogs. And for obvious reasons, a, a dog is far more adept at finding a missing person, whether they be alive or dead. And we used dogs both outside the property and inside the property. One of the dogs that we used was um, a victim recovery dog and part of the speciality of that dog is to seek out dead bodies, cadavers. Eddie was brought in to check the house, room by room. It was the first time Chris Ellis had used such a dog. I was a little bit skeptical about how they would work. Believing that there was no crime scene there and not seeing any physical signs of a crime scene, it was difficult for me then to to decide that we we're going to put this dog in there that was going to tell me something differently. Now, it searched the house all the way through and then went into the main lounger of the house. And when it got between the patio doors and a settee, the dog started barking. Now, I wasn't sure what this meant at that time. And um, when I spoke to the handler, he explained to me that that was his indication that a dead body had been in that area. This dog now indicating that a dead body had been in that room changed our thoughts entirely, and we had to look more deeply into the forensic element of that house. Police took over the house, and experts from the Forensic Science Service moved in. Adrian moved out and went to live with his close friend, Ted, Kate's brother, who owned the farm where he and Kate first met. 
When he stayed here, he was really quite strange then, actually. Pat was washing up, and she said, oh, Kate's going to look a fool, you know, when the police find her and she's caused all this trouble. And Adrian turned around and said, she's never coming back. And when he said that, it suddenly struck me. He knew more than he'd ever told us. And I told him then, if he had done anything stupid, he'd either be in prison for the rest of his life or looking over his shoulder. And he didn't answer. He just looked at me and didn't answer. But the search yielded no clue that Adrian had done anything. It didn't reveal any forensic evidence whatsoever, no blood. There was no sign that Red Hill Farm had been the scene of any serious assault. There was no, no sign of a clean-up. So whilst our efforts were directed at obtaining forensic evidence, those efforts ultimately proved completely fruitless. Police seeking forensic evidence to explain the disappearance of Kate Prout found nothing, but they were deeply suspicious of her husband, Adrian. If it was a murder, there were some unusual tasks and some unusual challenges to be faced because we had no body. The first thing we needed to establish quite simply was that Kate was dead. The second thing was that she'd been unlawfully killed and the third was that Adrian, her husband, was responsible for killing her. It was at that point that we began undertaking inquiries to establish proof of life, or as it should more properly, I guess, be, be described, proof of death. 2,200 inquiries were made with organizations in every field of life to see if Kate had been in touch they drew a blank. Could Kate have taken her own life or deliberately left? Kate had every motivation to stay around. What she was trying to do was secure a divorce settlement that would have resulted in her receiving a substantial sum of money. She was still making plans up to the point that she disappeared. Her life was still ongoing. I thought she could be dead. You don't like to think it at first. After several weeks, police felt they could prove Kate was dead and had been unlawfully killed. But without a body, would they be able to persuade a jury that Adrian was a murderer? The third thing we had to establish that Adrian Prout had killed Kate, and that was entirely based on circumstantial evidence, and consisted of their background, the domestic violence incidents, and the triggers of the final demand and the removal of money from the bank account. Police also explored as a possible motive Adrian's friendship with the house sitter. She always maintained there'd be no affair, though police found evidence of 171 phone calls and texts. On the day Kate disappeared, Adrian sent her a text telling her he loved her. But Kate's disappearance and the police investigation soon put the friendship under pressure. The house sitter was aware that Kate had disappeared and a conversation developed around that subject. She was concerned about Adrian's demeanor. He seemed quite distant, almost upset. And she started to ask him what had happened. And in response to one of these questions, Adrian said, they've taken her away, don't ask. He didn't say much more than that, but that clearly, in her mind, was some sort of indication that Adrian was somehow involved or responsible in Kate's disappearance in almost a very, very sinister way. Soon, the house sitter herself was interviewed by police. Though she remained in touch with Adrian for a short time after this, it wasn't long before she began to distance herself. the sort of feelings that she was getting about the possibility of Adrian's involvement, and certainly the attention that the police were paying to the house sitter herself as a result of her involvement with Adrian 
was becoming very stressful for her, and I think that was really the beginning of the end of their relationship. After three months, police had built a case around the circumstantial evidence. First, there was Kate's diary. Adrian also had motive. He loved another woman and wanted to keep the farm. Kate disappeared immediately after taking active steps in the looming legal battle. And finally, there was Adrian's record of violence. In February 2008, Richard and Linda received a visit. We opened the door to find this very tall chap standing there from the police, saying, nothing to worry about. Could he come in and would we like to sit down? And I think that was one of the worst things. We didn't know what he'd come to tell us, whether they'd found Kate, but he actually said that they had just arrested Adrian. In March 2009, Adrian Prout was charged with murder. Detective Constable Kerry Lloyd was appointed family liaison officer. They were very much shocked because they couldn't believe that somebody they knew, Kate's husband, could have actually murdered her. It was particularly difficult for Ted because he was close to Adrian. They, Ted very much saw Adrian as a close friend and I guess a confidant as well. And, and Ted had very much welcomed him into the, the farm whilst police were searching for Kate. Very difficult to deal with. You know, you don't think of a, a good friend murdering your sister. And I did, I did find that hard to come to terms with. I really did. Adrian appeared at Cheltenham Magistrates Court and was then sent for a four-week trial at Bristol Crown Court. He denied murder and told the court his life had moved on. Since the alleged crime, he'd found a new fiancé who'd just given birth to a baby girl and was living with her on the farm. He was allowed bail, an added stress for Kate's family. He was free to wander around the court and, and so on, and, and they would bump into him and, and sort of have to share the waiting area outside the court at times. And this they did find very difficult to deal with. In the witness box, Adrian stuck to his story, but the jury didn't believe him. Kate's family were there to hear the guilty verdict. People just sat there holding hands and very, very tense and nervous. And certainly when the verdict was given, it was just an electric atmosphere in court. And of course, the, the family were, were crying. They were overcome with emotion and they could hardly believe what they'd heard. On February the 5th, 2010, Adrian was found guilty of murder, even though how he'd done it was never proven. We could only really speculate about what actually happened to Kate Prout. I mean, the, there is one person that, that I would suggest that does know, and that's Adrian Prout. But the judge, on in his sentencing remarks, agreed with the prosecution proposition that Adrian killed Kate in an unplanned but provoked attack, if you like, that, that sparked as a result of the divorce disagreement and a culmination of things that had happened in the days leading up to the 5th of November. The probability is that he killed her with his bare hands and probably by strangulation. The fact that there was no forensic evidence found at the house would suggest that there was no blood seen. So that scenario would seem to make perfect sense and fit the circumstances. How Adrian disposed of the body is unknown. Police did consider the possibility Kate had been fed to pigs, but suspect there's a more obvious answer. Adrian was a professional pipe layer and had his own business with heavy machinery, pipe laying machinery. So he did have all the equipment that you could use to conceal a body um, under the ground. 